Hello, everyone. This is the Barnes and Noble Book Club. I am Gillian Flynn, and now today I have the great honor of having a Q and A with Sarah Langen, who did uh, wrote the amazing, amazing book, Good Neighbors. Um, Sarah, I just I want to start first of all with just saying thank you for writing this book. Like this book is one of my favorites that I've read this year. It just, I mean, from the opening filled me with dread, which I, is my favorite emotion and pulled me through. And, but it's, you know, it's, it's so much, there's so much going on. The writing is so great. I was underlining and dog earing passages and, um, and, what I love about it is that you really, the characters involved, you understand them on a really deep psychological and emotional level. And you certainly do what I like to do with my books, which is to make people root or at least understand people who are doing bad things. Um, and, and to sort of pull, you know, that reminder of that, we're all, we all do the, the common, the common thread of humanity is we all do good things and we all do bad things. And, um, and sometimes maybe the rush of judgment, which you, the, you capture so well, that pull of, of opinion, which is so, so relevant to this day. Um, it, it, you just capture that so well too. So I, what I would like to you to do, I will, I will let you talk now. Um, can you tell for for people who are tuning in who haven't read the the book and I know a lot of people have but could you I want you to give the synopsis because I don't want to give anything away that you don't want me to give away <laughs> sure um thank you Gillian Flynn like I I'm so excited <laughs> I'm such a fan <laughs> this is like so exciting I woke up this morning like oh my god is it real so, I was so I was reading this, I was telling my husband, I was like, Shit, we're going to be best friends. I know. Like this, <laughs> this woman has, this woman is inside my brain. She gets me, but that's really, you know, that's the sign of great writing, you know, right? Is that, you know, to me is that you feel like you feel those emotions that you thought were hidden deep inside you suddenly emerge on the page. So congratulations again. Thank you. I feel like, I feel like that's what I want to do um, is to make people feel not alone and not ashamed um, because I think that shame is a really dangerous and destructive emotion. And I think the more you feel like people have the same, like feminine rage is something that's not really allowed in our culture. Yes. And I really wanted to write about that. And I really wanted mothers especially to feel like it's okay to have those feelings and it doesn't make you bad. There's such pressure on women to be perfect but specifically there's pressure on mothers to be perfect and if and if you say that you're not happy in your job at any point for any reason or that you're not feeling maybe that you're adequate to the job um it's as if you're inviting censure people just love to dive in and tell you um well, you're not allowed to feel that way it's dangerous to our culture and, and that's what I love about this book is that peeling away of that. Cause I do think women are now besieged by the power of positivity. Women can do anything bullshit, you know, uh, I caught myself, but um, yes. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, that sure. It's great on one level. It's, it's awesome, you know, to have that positive vibe, but it's become so commodified and so commercialized that it is aimed at us 24 seven in a way that has, to me has become really overwhelming and exhausting. And it's, it is that idea of you aren't allowed to have negative thoughts. And if you have negative thoughts, then you're saying you're not a feminist. You're saying you're, you're not, you know, you go girl, you're defying, you're to define that message that we've now commodified and you're endangering us. And it, it really makes me angry. You know, and it's the same time, like, but we've never had a woman president. So I, I think like the, there's a reality that we're all supposed to pretend isn't real. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and if you say something about it, you're, you're angry. You're a mm -hmm. feminist. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're bitter. Yeah. And it's like, I'm just trying to face reality here where, where the kinds of 
um, criticism that I'm exposed to just living my life is far greater than what a man has to deal with. And I think it's especially for mothers, because I think our culture is like uh, sanctioned the center of mothers because we're uh, supposedly in charge of the next generation. And, and so for the future of our culture and our society, it's okay to criticize everything we do. And there's no doing it right. I remember that book Lean In came out. I should summarize the book soon, but I remember that book Lean In came out and it was like, I was mad. I was like, well, I don't want to lean in. You know, I'd have to take my kids to the dentist. She's a bad mom. And it's like, no, she's not. She's just trying to tell people you don't have to do everything. There's just like internally, we criticize each other externally. Like it's just, it's endless. And it starts from pregnancy on. I mean, I still remember, you know, my kids are six and 10 now, but I still remember being in tears, reading some guidebook about where it's like, everything you put in your body, you are making, you're putting in your child's DNA and in, and that's going to go in their child's DNA. And I'm just like sobbing, like, did I have my, <laughs> you know, my, um, black strap molasses today. I remember because the iron. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it was. Oh, uh, then I decided. Well, to, so. I'll, I'm going to summarize it, but just really quickly. Yeah. I had the same right, thing with please. Dr. Sears because I remember being, I went to my husband, I was pregnant. I was like, maybe I don't deserve to have a baby because he said that I didn't deserve one unless I was committed. And I was going to bring a picture of my baby to work, but I shouldn't ideally even be working because of nursing. And it was like, I'm going to summarize, but it's like, Yes. What? These are the books that are recommended to us? Like oh we're human God. beings. And the, you know, and the nursing, the fetishization of nursing versus non-nursing and even what that means. And I'm not even going to, I'm not going to reveal if I nurse, I'm not going to ask you because it's no one's <laughs> yes. business. And it's like business, but it is, it's such a. Your job is to be a writer, but people get to talk about whether you're nurse or not. It's like, <laughs> what? You know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the book, so the book is about, <laughs> it's like you a fish know, out of water. I'm going to call you offline. I know after this and we can yes. talk more about this. <laughs> it's, it's big. Um, and a lot of the book has to do with the right of women to their emotions. But the, the story is um, this fish out of water story about this family from East New York who, uh, come from bad backgrounds and a lot of personal tragedy, the parents, but they want to do right by their kids. So they've saved up for years. East New York's not a great place to live. You don't wanna raise your kids there. And they've had this dream of a house, of a place with stairs and college and these ideas that are the American dream. So they buy this house on a cul-de-sac um, in a town called Garden City, Long Island and everyone is middle class or upper middle class there and they don't quite fit these these parents the dad has tattoos and smokes publicly, yeah. you know which you don't do in the suburbs you do it privately uh and the mom is a former beauty pageant queen and she's off-putting because she's so frightened of everyone that she can't uh that she's constantly smiling and fake and nobody will accept that and also she dresses kind of cheap and so no, everyone's suspicious of her, of the family, and they're not doing well. They're not successful until the next door neighbor, who is the queen bee of the block, Rhea Schroeder, uh, takes a liking to them. And she is uh, someone with her own wounds that she's been hiding. And what she sees is something kindred in Gertie, the other mom. And she wants a real friendship and she wants something real in her life. So she welcomes the wild. I and add, I'd love to add, she's not necessarily emotionally equipped to have a friendship. Like she's, she's not the kind of person she's out. She's one of those people outside. She seems perfectly able to socialize, but internally, once you get into her character, you find out all these, the, her tendency to isolate and not be able to reach out. So it makes it all the more personal. <laughs> And to me, it's like that was such a revelatory moment because you see Rhea um, externally and who she is for, for several chapters. And then you go into her point of view and you realize that all the judgments you made as a reader about who she is are wrong too. And I just think that's such a brilliant thing. So 
sorry, continue. You're so Thank upset. you. Well, she's, she's like that. She's the person who walks in the scene and immediately has to be in charge. And you think it's because, oh, she's just a good leader, but it's also because she can't stand the judgment of others. And the best way to avoid that is to always take an authority position. So what happens is Rhea and Gertie plug in the wrong way. And this, this beautiful, this, what could have been a really good friendship and something that nourished them and made their families thrive, plugged wrong. And they both come out bruised and it's disastrous. And so Rhea immediately begins spreading rumors and all the inside information that she had about Gertie, that Gertie revealed to her about her history and about the fact that Arlo used to be a drug addict, her husband. Now the whole neighborhood knows. And so at the beginning of the story, they've been isolated. They're not invited to the 4th of July barbecue. And as the wilds are wont to do, they're like, we're going to make this work anyway. We're going to just try and fit in despite that. And they come to the 4th of July barbecue just as a sinkhole appears because it's the near future and it's um, global warming is much more evident. So that happens. And we realize there's danger on the block that's also external. And what happens is one of the kids falls down the sinkhole and the neighbors begin to believe because of these rumors that have already started about the wilds, that the wilds are at fault and they have done something bad and a mob begins to rise up. So that's the setting for this story. Yeah, that's a perfect, uh, a perfect setup it is a perfect, I mean, it enables you to come at, you know, it's, it's my fair way of writing too. It's why I write mysteries, which is that you can sort of do this A storyline. Yours is the sinkhole and, 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 and what that sort of does. Um, and, you know, and, uh, you know, mine is sort of the engine of the mystery to pull things through. Well, and that enables you the ability to talk about all the things that you want to talk about, the gender and, and um, you know, the rules of families and, and you know, what, what it is to be a family, what it is to be part of a neighborhood in, in that case. And I just think it's so brilliantly done that this kind of outside incident helps bring about you know, the, this sensation that would, you know, if you'd come at it differently, I, I'm, I will admit, I might've been less likely to read it. I, you know, I, 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 sometimes I will fully admit that these days, um, I like to, you know, I, I guess I, I'm not even guilty about it. I'd like to be entertained. I like a book to be entertaining. I, I will do the homework books. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and the ones that are, you know, respect that I respect, but don't necessarily love, you know, in this book, I both respect and love. And I think that's, you know, it, it just gets, you know, it's, it doesn't get enough. Those kind of books don't get enough respect. I think, you know, those books that are like page turners, oh my gosh, you know, that those sell well, but they don't always get the respect. Once you get slapped with the page turner, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's the respect doesn't always come hand in hand. And to me, it's like, it's harder to pull off something that examines all of human nature while being a page turner, people. <laughs> it's that's actually harder work. And I'm not, don't feel bad about doing it. No, I mean, like, I want to write books that people can't stop, can't put down. But of course, like, I want to write about things that are important to me. And so, yeah, and I get, I feel the same way. I get a lot, I got a lot of like, it's a great suburban, you know, gossip yeah. story <laughs> and I'm like well okay no, so, much that. so much more than that I want to be very clear to everyone watching today and so I also want to get into um you know your background as horror writing you are the founder of the Shirley Jackson award um and you know you and I share an affinity for Shirley Jackson and for Lois Duncan I discovered and I would love to gush with you about the amazing Great Lawrence Duncan, who definitely formed all of my, <laughs> my childhood writing dreams. I, I hid Summer of Fear. Like I was reading it and then I, I didn't want to stop reading it when I was a kid. So I had to hide it face down. <laughs> Summer of Fear is my favorite of hers too. I am obsessed with that book. I, <laughs> I give it to every small child I come across. <laughs> 
Now, every every tween, I feel like, needs to read some of her fear at some point because it's so it's the perfect perfect YA book. It's so great. That and that and the Westing game are the two uh, that I'm obsessed with. Are you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I read it to my kids. They were bored. I was like, "Why are you bored?" Like. <laughs> Okay, so my son just turned 10, and I will totally admit that I'm trying to find the exact right time to read The Westing Game with him, because if he doesn't like it, I will judge him, and I will be like... <laughs> <laughs> You're not worth my time. <laughs> we go back to, um, again, we, I digress, but um, you, uh, co-founder Shirley Jackson Award, um, MFA, uh, three Bram Stoker Awards. So I would love to hear, and you also have an, the the two things that combine so perfectly in this book, you have an MFA in creative writing from Columbia and a degree in toxicology. Am I getting that right? From NYU, <laughs> which obviously come to play in this book along with those horror roots. So I'd love to hear you talk about, you know, to me, this feels like so many threads of your background are coming together in this book. Well, so I got my MFA from Columbia in creative writing, and that was a great experience. And I met a lot of really good people. They didn't do genre at that time. I don't know if you had that same experience, but it was like, don't write about horror. And I was like, but that's all I do. Um, So when I graduated, I fell in with the Horror Writers Association, which was a bunch of New Yorkers. I've been to the Stoker Awards. They are the most, I, and I advise everyone to attend the Stoker Awards at one point because yes, it, <laughs> put on a party. Yeah, they're a lot and of fun. The humans. I mean, I, I've always been told like horror writers tend to be the nicest people, romance writers watch out for. And that because of the degree of, you know, the horror writers get it all out. And I don't know, I've been, certainly attending the Stoker Wars, I found that to be true because everyone is so freaking nice and cool. But there, yeah. it was it was a really <laughs> inclusive group and uh, they invited me to their writing group called Who Wants Cake, which is still going in New York. And that was where I learned my horror chops because I was never allowed to really, you know, I'd been writing my first book, The Keeper at Columbia, but you you didn't really know it was a horror novel until page 200 because I wasn't allowed to have a ghost in it. So so I kept like waiting until like- That that makes my heart hurt that you had to like walk around what your love was. Yeah, it was so, they don't, they're not like that anymore, but you know, it was the nineties. They were like, horror is a genre that shouldn't exist. Like it's, it's for morons. Like fantasy and sci-fi and, you know. Yeah. Yeah. They also didn't know how to teach it and they didn't know what it was, you know? So, so I learned that and that was really helpful and uh, they were really good people and they're just really accepting the horror community. Mm -hmm. And then I wound up getting, I hated my day job and I just needed, you know, I was like working in, in publishing and I was just like, this is, I'm never going to make enough money that I could have a day off to write with this job. So I went into toxicology thinking I'd get a job in, you know, the EPA or something that would be fun. And at that same time, my first book deal came through. So you know, I just finished getting the degree, which was great fun. And like, you okay. Know, so, so tell, you know, tell us how the toxicology degree informed this book, if, if it did. I mean, it seems like it had to. And, and this book is brilliant because it's filled with, it tells part of the story um, through, you know, openings of, a, of another, uh, of a fictionalized book that has been written about what happens on Maple Street. That's where they give excerpts and reviews and discussions of it. Um, and it's so smart because, I mean, that sets the tone for the whole story is that first opening that is from the other book, talking about the other book um, and uh, and the musicals that have been made about it and the, the role playing and or sort of, you know, howling costumes and it really, you get this chill. I mean, I, that first page, I was, I was already like on the edge of my seat. And then you're able to tell some of the story, um, you know, about the sinkhole through, you know, news clippings and that sort of thing. I just think it's a brilliant way to do exposition. I mean, it's so, to me, it was, it's so smart. I, 
you know, I had a lot of fun with that. Um, that turned into a totally different question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so good. <laughs> I love this book so much. Um, I don't want to talk about it forever, but, um, and, um, okay. So toxicology, how to inform the book, and then you can go into if there, you know, is there anything to say aside from it's a brilliant way to tell a story from those excerpts that you use. Uh, toxicology. <laughs> there was, I just heard from my teacher, he commented on Facebook, like I'm teaching environmental toxicology while you have your talk with Gillian Flynn or I'd go. And he taught my I know, thermodynamics of global warming class. And I remember we proved global warming, like just proved it, you know, in every possible way and what was happening at the sure. last day of the class, he said, you know, any questions? And I said, so where do we go from here? You know, like what, what's next? And he was like, oh, I have no idea. Like it's not reversible, you know? <laughs> so I remember being, and this was more than 10 years ago, 15 years yeah. ago. And people are still fighting over whether it's real. Anyway, so yeah. sinkholes yeah. are very clearly caused by global warming and it's known and it's, it's the increased heat makes, makes the erosion. And just, um, so it's about that. It's about the ways that we're sort of cashing checks, the generation before us and before us and now us yeah. that are blank. And it's a debt that our children have to pay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, uh, and it's, and it's already I just have to say that point is so elegantly made in this book. And I, I you know, there are different ways to do it that are more outright you know what the, this is what this book is about this is the theme but it's so elegantly wove, woven in that it's just you deal with so many fascinating topics which uh here's my segue which we will now explore with uh questions um from our readers uh or our watchers i guess in this case um okay i'm just uh yes okay so here this leads nicely into kind of what i was going on um, Milda DeVoe says, can you talk about the cool maps and lists? Did you insist on these or was that added later? Um, yeah, so, so talk about that, it was, which is, it's, it's awesome, that's great. First, hi Milda, that's my friend from grad school. <laughs> <laughs> well, you need your pals to write in. <laughs> um, no, so I I uh, I had map to come when I submitted it because my husband had done the maps, but they were not professional. And my agent was like, "They might, this might not just 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 do the the list and then see what happens." And then Simon and Schuster hired an artist, and uh, he illustrated the maps. And they we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, and they were really crazy enthusiastic and helpful which was, you know, nuts to me. I couldn't believe it. And then I messed up. This is like a little anecdote where in, in copy edits, like some things didn't match with the maps and like really quickly, the copy editor just suggested we cut four maps. And I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Do that. And then like the galley came out and I was like, I cut all my own maps. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> so I wrote to my agent, my editor, and I was like, I ruined everything. Can we get them back? And they were like, yeah, you know, <laughs> they just Dude, put them back in. They were, yeah, they, they've been I, so amazing to work with. The, I, I, so there's the, if I will not over explain this, but in, in um, Gone Girl, I did the same, I wrote this thing called the Cool Girl speech, which now, ah, <laughs> ta da. Um, and that was came from a writing exercise that I did where I was really stuck. And when I'm stuck, I never let myself stop writing, but I let myself stop writing technically what I'm writing. So I'll write something from a different character's point of view that's not going to go in the book or, um, you know, the, uh, those kind of things. And so I wrote this idea of what Amy wrote at her magazine uh, you know as, as a, a woman who writes about women issues and it became the cool girl speech and my whole rule is you can't put in anything that you do as your writing exercise in your book because 
that makes you self-conscious and the writing exercise doesn't work or some stupid rule. I don't know. I can't even remember the rule, but so I put that in and took it out so many times. And if you look at it, it really has no place in the book. I mean, it's, it's purely two pages that I really liked, but Great. I did, I did finally leave it in and I'm so glad um, <laughs> that I did. Cause it's become, you know, but a lot of people really responded to it. So I'm going to enough about me. Um, okay. Ray Jordan says, was Shelly's behavior a result of mental illness or from Rhea's abuse? Um, you know, uh, I have two answers to that. And the first answer is sometimes- um, Spoilery one. <laughs> Cause well, I, made, I, I don't know if I gave away something- re- Oh uh, no, that's not spoiler. Okay. Cause that okay. happens in the first hundred pages. Okay. But cool. I, I was just gonna say like, Sometimes I write things that I'm not aware of and it's, I don't like taking things away from the reader by saying like, oh, it's this when maybe it's not that. Maybe I don't know as well as your instincts tell you. But the second thing is I think uh, very clearly when you're raised by a narcissist, they force you to reflect back the image they have of themselves. And that's very, very confusing because you know what reality is but you're also told there's a different reality that you're constantly forced to say is real. And so I think, um, I think that's Shelly's dilemma and I don't think there's anything wrong with Shelly. Yeah, excellent. Um, Karen Barros asks, why did you decide to place the setting in the future? And, and tell them, I, you, you know better than I, what, remind me the exact date in the future, because it's, it's a near future day. You know. Yeah, it's like 2027. Okay. And, you know, first off, it's just, it took me forever to get anything published. So I was like, it's probably not going to be published if I get it <laughs> until 2027. But, <laughs> but maybe I it'll all be true and it'll feel, it'll <laughs> already happen. <laughs> be like my reported. Yeah. <laughs> But I I kept it that way because I felt like the climate is disaster, climate emergency is only going to get worse. And I think that it's going to have a huge economic strain on Americans in, you know, we, we, uh, these hurricanes, these sinkholes, all these, these pandemics that are caused in part by global warming are going to make us all a little more anxious more food insecure, more job insecure. And so I wanted it to be our world, but uh, more stark and more anxious than the one right now, which is strangely hard to imagine given we're all on Zoom in a pandemic, which seems, even saying it out loud, it seems, really, this is still happening? Your mind does this little heat wave dance in every once in a while, mine does, where it sort of like goes like, this is really happening. You know, you, you get used to it and then all of a sudden you'll have a moment and take it in kind of, whoa, that's, this is heady, crazy stuff. And your, I mean, your book does the two things. It does the, I mean, predicts the, it predicts the climate crisis, which in turn issues the virus crisis. And it also does, you know, to me, the, again, it's the, that idea of mob mentality that it shows so well that you that you see just reflected, I feel like every day more and more during this pandemic. Online, yes, but online can often translate into real life. Um, the storming of the Capitol, it was like, it was kind of inevitable when you think back on it, but also shocking. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, your book just, uh, I will go back to, I will stop talking. <laughs> ask you a question rob schmidt says love the book but have lived in many suburbs across the country and i've never experienced the attitudes expressed in your book do you really believe suburbs are like this oh that's a good question um no i don't believe that they're like what you find at the cul-de-sac but remember it's more anxious it's the near future and i have half of the neighbors leave Um, And they leave because they have the means to do so and the good judgment. So the people who stay feel tied to that area and they feel tied to Shelly. Well, they feel tied to the sinkhole and what happened there. And I think it's those people. And I think specifically their their better instincts were used against them. 
their concerns, and their hopes for their own children. And remember when false, when any kind of allegation of child abuse or child danger or uh, sexual abuse is lodged, uh, it is a parent's job to assume that person is guilty, um, whether it's just a 1.001% chance. And so I think keep that, you know, I think that's also playing a role. That's a um, great, yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think too, it's, again, it, like it, it examines that idea where you, that you have, um, where this could only happen with this particular group of people at this particular time and place in this particular set of circumstances. And I think so often, I mean, I'm fascinated with, with those moments of violence with, I'm a, I'm a, uh, you know, for good or for bad, we can discuss this later, but I'm a true crime addict. And there are so many things that I ingest where it's sort of like, this could only have happened with these three particular people getting together, finding each other, this particular day, this, you know, that sort of thing. And I think, you know, that's a lot, that's sort of a fascinating portion about this is like that buildup where you look at something crazy from the outside and you think, how in the world could this have happened? But then you get internalized and you're like, oh, this was kind of inevitable. And I think uh, in the era of Facebook and social networking, uh, people are just uh, more likely to become radicalized in ways they were not before. Sure. And I think it's more, it's, it's an uncommon event that I'm writing about that is becoming increasingly more common um, because I think people feel that it's their moral obligation to, uh, to cast judgment. Um, somehow the social networks have convinced us that if we don't do that, that people are dying that we're, you know, we're losing our democracy, that, you know, and all these, so we're constantly say, casting judgment on things we know nothing about. And we're unable to see the people we're casting judgment on, which is very dangerous. Yes, watch Social Dilemma, everyone. It was all bad. Um, Aaron Skelly says, and excuse me if I say this wrong, the bitu bitumen, bitumen? Um, but B I T U M E N is what, what, how do you say that? It's tar sands in the, in the sinkhole. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, great symbol, by the way, seeps into every aspect of their lives. Is this type of seepage an actual phenomenon? And how did you come up with the idea? It's totally not. Um, I think one of the joys of having this degree in toxicology is that I can make things seem like <laughs> they're real when they're not. <laughs> I wanted, I wanted a symbol for um, the ways that the sinkhole just kept getting deeper and infecting their lives more. Um, and this bitumen that they're tracking all over the place was perfect. I mean, there are tar sands on Long Island um, and, you know, they, they, uh, they can be extracted and used as a fossil fuel, but it's insanely expensive and they don't um, coalesce the way that happens with this sinkhole. Um, but then again, what's interesting about global warming is sort of our rules of reality are breaking down in ways we didn't expect. Like, uh, you know, the permafrost melts and uh, uh, anthrax that we've never seen before rises out and starts killing cows in Siberia. You know, this happened like 10 years ago. Um, or like hail on summer days when you didn't expect it, or all these sinkholes. So these things that, um, you know, it, also the part of, of having the bitumen happen and the way that it forms was this idea of, of um, the physical planet changing in ways that feels supernatural. Um. Amirakel Provost asks, what advice would you give indie authors? Um, you know, I feel like advice is free for a reason. And I, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like everyone, um, everyone has to take their own path and everyone has a very distinct path before them. So, I guess the only advice I have is, is to, 
try and study your market, find out what market you're in, find out where things are selling and um, follow your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm just going to pile out and jump on here too, is, you know, and I, 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 I'm with you where the advice is, it's hard to give advice because I think very strongly that everyone has to find out how they write and what they want to write about. And, you know, to me, that is the key is, you know, I, I feel like I spent two years reading books on how to write books instead of writing and learning how I, I myself write and every writer has a different way of doing it. I mean, I would love to hear your rituals if you're a nine to five person or, you know, or, or you write when, you know, there also, there's no such thing as a muse that's going to come down and write and help you write when you feel like it. And you're never going to get a book done if you write when you feel like it. So to me, it's, uh, it's the thing of finding out how you write. I write really inefficiently. I don't write with a, um, with any sort of outline. I don't write knowing what the ending is. It's a Me neither. Uh, uh, <laughs> another thing we have in common. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and, and it's a really inefficient way to write, but I have, I tried to write my first novel with an outline and I did best when I got to the end and realized that my outline was wrong because of what I had written and it didn't work. And the person, you know, there were massive plot point changes that I made when I kind of went back and just followed the characters I was most interested in and, and let that, you know, and that's the fun anyways, is like letting that magic take over and re like really like, ah, oh, I didn't think this book was about this, but it is. Um, yeah, so, um, sorry to- I'm there, I'm No, I, I, I feel the same way. This is a great one, Ray Jordan. What are your favorite horror novels and writers? Oh, well. <laughs> Which I know you have thoughts on. Gillian Flynn. <laughs> <laughs> and I brought a few out. I brought, so Stephen King, Carrie. I love this book. Um, Walter Tepes, not. You've, you've mentioned before that Carrie with its excerpts and different, um, uh, help me out. Different newspaper articles and, newspaper and articles. all that. I mean, you know, helped, helped inspire you a little bit with this. Oh, it totally did. I reread Carrie. Cause I was like, I want to make a page turner out of this. <laughs> How did he do it? <laughs> I was like, and he's a master at it. He does such a good job. Uh, Ill will. Amazing. Yes. What else? Um, I feel like this is super underrated Peyton place. Like this woman. Oh, Peyton you know, place. yes, of course. She wrote in a bathtub with a board over it while the four and locked the four kids out of her, her bathroom to get this done. She died of alcoholism. She's amazing. And people are like, it's a soap opera. And it's like, no, it's, it's an American tragedy. I feel this, I mean, there are certain, you know, like read everything by Ira Levin, um, you know, read Rosemary's Baby. It is, if you like that movie, it, it is taken exactly from, that book page by page. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and he also wrote Boys from Brazil and he also wrote Stepford Wives. I mean, he is a really, to me, criminally um, under, under known these days, but like, his books are sensational. And Thornbirds, I love Thornbirds, which I find like delightful. Um, okay. Um, well, that's like- Not a horror, it, but delightful. It's kind of horrible. Like he's a priest and she's 11. Like, <laughs> starts and her mom hates her right. her mom's jealous all right back to horror it's horror <laughs> um, <laughs> um, um alexander lopez asks what motivated you to write on this genre instead of doing another horror book um uh, yeah so was it I, I and i'm curious too did it start out as a horror book and you kind of realized it, it was something different yeah, so I, I started it and it wasn't a sinkhole, it was an asteroid and I had all the same dynamics, but like lots more characters because I always like to write, you know, it's, um, and a monster comes out and it just didn't work and I put it aside and then I looked at it five years later and was like, I still can't make this work and then I sat down and realized it was about, uh, it's a human story 
and the, the, there is no monster. And it's about the sort of conversations we all have with ghosts, like the, the, the things we're afraid of that don't exist and we're projecting. And once I realized that, and then I wanted it specifically to be about this relationship between two women that goes wrong, um, because I mean, that's, that's, that's the meat. So, um, so once I realized that it was pretty easy to come through, but it was really hard to figure out how to write a non-horror book because I'm so used to like dun 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 and you start a horror novel with like these are my character's weak spots that are going to be made vulnerable yeah. in the middle and then they're going to vanquish it or not and I'll have some social commentary and and this is such a different story because it's it's I could never have my subtext out in the open and I, it always had to be about these, just these really as realistic as I could make them human relationships, which was completely new for me. I mean, you've been doing that for your whole career, but I was like, this is so hard, <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, I mean, anytime you have to change the, like, the rhythms that you're used to and the way you write, um, it's, it's, I just, uh, I can't applaud you enough for pulling this off because it's it's really hard to change. I mean, I'm I'm I say this because I'm struggling with this right now. I'm trying to do something kind of different. Um, and you really, you know, you just realize there's the certain things have different tonalities and rhythms and pacing and 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 you know. So how far were you into uh, the book as a horror book before just- you realized? I kept rewriting the same 200 pages and it was like, you know, when you, when you're like rewriting and the words are fine, but it doesn't matter because it's not the story. (laughs) So I went back to page one and cut everything, cut almost every character, but it was the same. It was just looking at the story from a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, I would, I would say that in my advice too, or, or, or just insight to anyone who's writing a book now who's watching this is, so much of writing is rewriting. Um, and you're like, to me, my main goal is to have a really, really awful first draft. And, <laughs> and so that I can see everything that's wrong with this book. And I sometimes have done the same thing where um, I just, I'm like, this is not the book. And you, and you know, I don't even try to keep anything. I'd had a first draft of Dark Places, my second book, and just cut pretty much everything from page one after I'd written a first draft. I was just like, this is wrong and I'm not gonna try to Frankenstein it and keep anything. Cause that's, I know it just has to be different point of view. So it's like, there's nothing wrong with your book if you realize it stinks and you need to do it. Well, you're also crazy inventive. So, I mean, you're saying that you're, you're doing it sort of a new genre but also within genre, you're insanely inventive. Like you're sort of, doing new things and breaking rules. Just, oh. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's from Alexander Lopez. Uh, it's for Gillian. Would you direct screenplay this book if you had the chance? Oh my God. And I'm, yes, please. Done. Um, John Urquhart Ur- says, do you feel most readers grasp all the shortcomings of the residents of Maple Street? Um, and it's interesting that the kids were much more informed. Um, he has part of a, of a quotation mark on informed. So I don't know if that is informed or informed. But. So do I feel like the readers grasp the neighbor's shortcomings? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think at the end of the day, what I wanted to talk about was the way we come to conclusions, especially like on social media, um and say like this is what i think and then we double down and then somehow our egos are invested and we won't pull back and i wanted it to be a little bit about that so uh you know i think i think it's very brave um and very difficult to reevaluate your opinion and think maybe i was wrong that whole time maybe you know and uh so it's about that 
And, and I would jump on and say, you know, for me, uh, I don't mind if someone has a different opinion about a character than I do, or that, you know, I thought I intended you to me, a, a really great book uh, is the book that spurs conversations and the people have very different opinions over who's good or who's bad or who or why someone did something. And, and that's what makes, you know, a book, a, a conversation starter is when people do have radically different ideas. So to me, I never mind, you know, to me, my goal is never, am I getting my point across about this character? It's like, I write the character I write and then let people, you know, judge away. It doesn't bo bother me in the least. I love it, in fact. So, um, Donna O'Meara says, your title's Good Neighbors. Is anyone as be is anyone being as as anyone being a good neighbor? Do the kids ultimately inform us as what it means to be a good neighbor? Um, you know, I think I think that's kind of a little bit of a spoiler. Um, but I do want to say that um, I don't think that people are inherently bad. And uh, when I was researching for this book, I, I studied Kitty Genovese and I studied the Stanford prison experiments and I studied mom mentality. And what I found was that um, these are all stories we tell ourselves about what human nature is and they're not true. They're just narratives. So Kitty Genovese did not die alone. That was just a fiction. The neighbors did call the police and she was held by one of the neighbors um, one of the neighbors held her in her arms as she died. Um, the Stanford prison experiment was kind of a hoax. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do and they fulfilled the roles of guard and prisoner um, because they wanted to please their professor whom they liked. It was not because they were inherently uh, blank slates who were gonna be masochists or sadists because they were told to be. Um, you know, I think uh, it's so much about the stories we tell ourselves about who we are. And I think um, the people in this story who decide despite these narratives, these terrifying narratives to try to be open and try to be kind um, are insanely brave. So. That, and Sarah, I could talk to you all day, but that is a great way to end this particular conversation. Oh. With, I do another book club with you next month if you're available. <laughs> um, I would love that. <laughs> let's do it. Just our standing conversation. I want to um, talk about strangers on a train. Let's tell, oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, I'm calling and you later. Bronson Prince Pinchot, like he does that, this great narration too. It's, we're doing it. I'm <laughs> so clearly we could talk all the rest of the day, but um, I would, uh, Good Neighbors, uh, Barnes & Noble exclusive edition is available at your local stores and 24 seven on barnesandnoble.com um, and buy it. Anyone who is, uh, do, don't borrow it for someone, buy it, it's important, <laughs> it's really. It helps, we get to write more books. <laughs> it really helps, um, so. Thank you all very much for tuning in and um, my good neighbors. That's enjoy it. You will, you'll have so much to talk about. Read it with, read it with a pal. Um, all right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Alex.